MDR Sometimes that's what and, you have yeah. to do, right? You have to rip off the Band-Aid and say, yeah. is this important to me? I mean, how important is it to live in a country where you feel free to do the things that you want to do and live the life that you want to live? Uh, I, I think that's worth everything. You absolutely have the sense that uh, everyone here expects things are, are getting better and everybody expects things everywhere else are getting worse. It comes down to, you know, where do you want to where do you want to place your bets? You know, uh, you, you have to you have to live somewhere. Yeah. You have to do something in life. Where are you going to do it? What are you going to do? And I can't think of a better place than El Salvador. And I can't think of a better project than Bitcoin. And We are live here from Bitcoin Beach. Today we have with us Jeremy from Escape to El Salvador. And I love the name Escape to El Salvador because five years ago, if you would have said that, people would have said, don't you mean Escape from El Salvador? What do you mean Escape to El Salvador? So I think uh, just the fact that we have a, a company like that that exists now in El Salvador says so much about what's happening. So I want to welcome Jeremy, hear a little bit about his backstory, how he escaped to El Salvador, uh, what his Bitcoin journey has been. So take it away, Jeremy. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mike. It's an honor to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, you're right. Uh, escape to El Salvador really turns the, uh, the, the equation on its head. Uh, there was actually a book that was written called Escape from El Salvador, and it was the story of a gentleman who was... Uh, leaving because of the gang violence. And I specifically wanted to highlight the uh, the irony that now people are leaving violence in other countries and coming here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy because having lived here for almost 20 years at this point, to have somebody think about escaping to El Salvador, to want a Salvadoran passport, to be trying to get their Salvadoran residency. We see you guys posting all these pictures of... Yeah. People, big smiling faces talking about getting residency here. I mean, that is such flipping things on its head. Yeah. And so, um, you know, obviously it's it's most people know the story of, of how things have been changing over the last, you know, three to four years. Um, but would like to know what your perspective is, what put El Salvador on your radar and what caused you to, to take up stakes and, and move here? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, in, in a word, Bitcoin. Uh, I, I've been a long term Bitcoiner and it's something that I've been passionate about for a long time, uh, but probably more on a more fundamental basis. I care about freedom and liberty. And my family and I decided to leave the States several years ago because we saw the writing on the wall and we left and we spent some time in Eastern Europe. Uh, the irony there, of course, is that we had to go to a former Soviet Republic in order to find a little bit of freedom in this world. Uh, and so we lived there for a while and uh, things were really great. Uh, we, we enjoyed the, the countries that we were visiting. The food was wonderful. The people were very nice and friendly and welcoming. Uh, but even uh, the governments there got a little bit out of uh, control during the, the COVID hysteria. And uh, as fate would have it at the same time that that was happening, the Bitcoin law was being passed here in El Salvador. And so for me, it was a no brainer. Uh, it was one of those situations where you read the news that morning and you buy your, your tickets that afternoon. And we made our plans and we came here and haven't looked back since. So I, I know you kind of have people come into Bitcoin from from two different ways. You have people that were already um, freedom was important to them. They're more libertarian. And so Bitcoin just kind of fit that. You have people that have never really thought about that or don't put that much importance on that. But once they enter into Bitcoin, that starts becoming more important to them. So for you, you were kind of always wired as a libertarian. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been involved in the, the space that sort of intersects uh, digital money and freedom, cyberspace, privacy, uh, personal rights, how we're changing uh, as a society with this technological revolution and uh, how that's going to impact you know, our lives on a, on a daily basis. I've been uh, very interested in that for many, many years. And uh, so that led me to, to Bitcoin. It led me to um, thinking about what it would look like to experiment with governance uh, on, a, on a localized basis. 
Um, that's sort of my origin story is that uh, I was originally involved in a project in Costa Rica back in the 90s that had aims that were very similar to Bitcoin City. Uh, it was called laissez-faire city. And um, we even had our own digital currency. We, we had a little piece of land out in the woods outside of the capital that we leased and we wanted to create a, a little uh, server farm and, and a place for folks to go to and, and experiment with what, um, what sovereignty would look like, uh, uh, what the, the individual sovereign thesis would play out. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, that particular project didn't work, but when Bitcoin City was revealed to the world, it just immediately pulled me in because I knew exactly what it was trying to accomplish. And I knew that I would spend, uh, you know, uh, my life trying to uh, help that project uh, succeed and, and anything that I can do to help, I'm happy to. So do you think that that past project, one of the reasons that it didn't succeed is because there wasn't something like Bitcoin at that point that was a universally accepted currency that that wasn't controlled by anybody? You are you are absolutely spot on. We So we had um, a Chomian Mint for, for those nerds of you out there listening. Uh, and obviously that's a, a centralized public key, private key type of digital currency. Uh, and it was doomed to failure because of the fact that it was centralized. If someone can manipulate it, if someone can put their hand in the cookie jar, they're going to, that's just human nature. Uh, and so you're absolutely right that Bitcoin solves that problem in a better way because it takes away the cookie jar. Uh, and so we have a sufficiently decentralized currency now. We don't have to worry about that aspect of it. We also had a, a, a bit of a problem with the uh, the government. The government uh, tolerated us and, and they were happy to sort of uh, cash the checks uh, for the land, but they kept it uh, kept us at arm's length through the, the process. Whereas today in El Salvador, uh, Bitcoin City is a signature part of the, the platform of Nueva Cideas and of the rebrand of the, the entire country. So I don't think we have to worry about uh, government support for Bitcoin City. And then the other reason that it failed in Costa Rica is that it was just really difficult to move there and get set up and start a new life in the 90s in Costa Rica. Uh, I, I like to tell people that the level of infrastructure and development there at that time is similar to what we experience here in El Salvador today. And so that's part of the reason why Escape to El Salvador exists, is to help that, um, that process, that individual that wants to come here and get set up, bring a family, start a business, uh, start a new life. That's what we're we're trying to we're trying to make that process easier for folks. And so you moved here a year and a half ago, About, or okay, right. okay. And it was just did you visit first, or <laughs> no? We we threw it, we we sold everything. We did the backpacks on 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 the airplane, and we just landed. And we knew that this was uh, what it was. And I got a, a a great vibe from the place, like right off the bat. And so many folks that I speak to that come here, uh, you know, share that same feeling. You you walk off the plane. Um, you're down there at San Luis Tapa and you you get the heat <laughs> that hits you in the face, but you, you you feel more free. You feel like a weight's been lifted. And so we definitely experience that as well. I think, too, just coming into the airport, especially more recently, just everything just works so well. Um, I, I was traveling job. just recently to, to Peru and it was just such a nightmare trying to get through immigration and yeah. hours in line. When when I land back here, I'm like literally be between when I land, if I didn't check my ba bags, I'm in my car within 10 minutes. Easy. I mean, it's easy. To it's do. like right through immigration, right through yeah. customs and right out the door. So. Yeah. I think there's just so many things that just function well in El Salvador. Well, that shows that if you put your mind to it and if you have a government that wants to succeed at a certain thing, that it can do it like it's possible to do it. And it just really opens your eyes that the failures that we see elsewhere are simply due to apathy. Well, and I, I can say from being here for quite a long time, that has changed in El Salvador. It hasn't right. always been that way. It used to be anytime you were in front of a government official, they were looking for a reason to say no. <laughs> yeah. Like that was job security for them. If yes. they say no, nobody can come back on them and, and criticize them. They're like, sure. no, I made them get another form or I made them jump through another hoop. Yeah. Where now you really get a sense that they wanna say yes. Yeah. Like they still want you to do things the right way. You, there are procedures sure. and sometimes it can seem a little bit tedious, but their goal is for you to pass through those things. And so Absolutely. it just makes it so much easier. I think so too. So you guys had never even visited 
That's right. You just got on a plane <laughs> and did you have a place lined up that you were going to land? Or? Well, so, I mean, I wasn't completely unfamiliar with uh, Central America, obviously, because of my experience in the 90s. So I knew a little bit about what I was getting into. It took a little convincing for the family, uh, certainly. Uh, but once we got here and set up, uh, we were fine. I was fortunate enough that I knew how to sort of reach out to real estate agents and whatnot beforehand to get set up in a place. So we were able to land and go right into a, a decent apartment and, and, and have the lay of the land uh, set out for us. So it was an easy transition for us because I'm the type of person that likes to do a lot of research uh, and, and really plan out uh, an itinerary for that sort of thing. And so uh, it, it was easier for me there. But I don't think that's necessary. I think that's probably just my personality that goes overboard in the area. I think that you could just jump on a plane with a backpack and get a hotel or an Airbnb on the fly. There's plenty available. You know, you can come and just experience it. Yeah. And when we were talking beforehand just about and I and I don't I've never been there, so I'm not I can't personally vouch for it. But there's like the Bitcoin landing spot is a place that That's right. is is available for people to just get a room and have a place they can work from while they're so we're seeing businesses like that pop up and I've only heard good things about them. So shout out to um, Matt and Gladys doing good work, guys. Yeah. So so having infrastructure <clears throat> like that is so crucial. It just makes it so much easier for people to yes. just hop on a plane and, and to make it. that decision and and burn the the boats and you know land. Sometimes here that's what and, you yeah. have to do, right? You have to rip off the band-aid and say, yeah. is this important to me? I mean, how important is it to live in a country where you feel free to do the things that you want to do and live the life that you want to live? Uh, I, I think that's worth everything. And you knew beforehand, just from your experience in Central America, that you wanted to be in the capital city at a higher elevation, not at the beach. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody's different, right? Yeah. You know, and, and don't get me wrong. I love coming to, to Bitcoin Beach uh, as, as a visitor. Uh, but if I want to live, I, I need a little bit cooler uh, of a climate. But that's what's great about El Salvador is that it has so many different areas. So depending on what you want out of your daily routine, you can have that here in El yeah. Salvador. No, I, I, I love the surf. I love being at the beach, yeah. but it is, is warm. And it's so warm. recently we bought a, a coffee farm at, at 1500 meters. And oh, it's, congratulations. I love going up there and it's kind of in the cloud forest yeah. area. And it's just so cool and nice. And so yeah. I think especially as I get older, I would see more living up there and visiting the beach. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, but my kids, while they're here, they want to be at the beach because oh, they absolutely. surf and do all that. So, and, but like you said, there's, there's so much for everybody. There's, you know, sophisticated parts of the capital city that you yep. can live in that have nice malls and all the modern conveniences that you would want. There's small rural towns at high elevation where the weather's cool. There's obviously beautiful beaches. And sure. so, and it, the great thing about El Salvador is it's such a small country. You can literally be, I mean, I can be... Day. From my, the house at the beach to yeah. the coffee farm in, in about 35 minutes yeah. and have a completely like a different, different world. world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. And a lot of places you can't have that. That's You'd true. have to you know travel days to get from one climate to the next. But El Salvador has all these different microclimates that yeah. makes it so much fun. Um, so you you guys had your backpacks. Yeah. You had a place your place was did you already have a lease signed or yeah, basically we we had it set up so that we we rolled right into it signed as we were uh coming in and um i i thought well you got really fortunate uh i love the place that we're in i like colonia escalon that's the neighborhood that, that that i live in yeah uh because it's close to the the government buildings that we interface with uh on a regular basis so it, it's convenient to us in terms of what we're doing with escape to el salvador uh but it's also it's great because you have access to services uh ubers are fast and cheap and all of that stuff as well yeah i think you get probably the most bang for your buck in that area too yeah. it's not the most expensive part of, of san salvador right. it's much cheaper than san benito or san elena yeah but you have it's a little bit higher elevation and you have you know everything's accessible we have a, a little condo in that area kind of right by the the hospital there and oh, it's yeah, nice. super convenient just as a, a home base while we're in sure. the, the capital city so um, you know, at times the traffic can be a little annoying, but yeah. you know, that's anywhere in the world. True. So, and hopefully we got, we got plans for trams. Uh, I'm looking forward to that as well. Like, uh, that, that should help relieve a lot of the traffic in San Salvador. And, uh, they're going to do the same thing from the beginning in Bitcoin city. I don't know if you saw some of those plans that were being, uh, published. Yeah, no, it's, 
it's uh, it's much easier to start from the beginning than yes. to come in afterwards <laughs> right. and uh, and try to make those things. But you know that's just the, the reality. And I'm glad to see the government's actually making changes yes. and making improvements because yes. in the past that rarely happened. Now, I mean, anywhere you go, you see road road work, you see yeah. improvements being done, and and it's yeah. big projects too. It's not yeah. just the road work. Like we, we're putting in the airport in the eastern part of the the country. That's going to be great. It's going to serve Bitcoin City. Uh, the train of the Pacific is a wonderful regional project. It's going to connect Panama City all the way through all of the capital cities of the different uh, countries. Go straight through Bitcoin City and all the way into Chiapas, Mexico. So it's going to really tie the region together. That's a big project. You talk about the deep water ports in uh, La Libertad and, and in La Union as well and Huachapan. Uh, those are just incredible projects that are maybe not as visible to the average tourist right now, uh, but are uh, definitely necessary and in, in, in setting the stage for some incredible economic growth over the next decade. Yeah. And I, I really hope those come to fruition. I'm, I'm always a little bit of a skeptic when it comes sure. to, to big projects, especially when you have to have a collaboration from different countries That's, and it's multiple politicians. So but if anybody can push something like that through, I, I think it's uh, President Bukele. So. Well, he's got the political capital right yeah. now to pretty much pull pull the heads of state together and say, listen, you know, he, he's just enormously popular and not just in El Salvador. There have been multiple polls throughout all of Latin America that show that he's and, and the world. that He's the most respected and admired world leader. Uh, and, and second place isn't even close. <laughs> so he has the except in the capital. press, except, except in, the press. in the press. Yeah, yeah. no, it's crazy. That the, the disconnect between what the the media kind of promotes and says right. and what when you when you talk to people on the street we were just at a conference in brazil and then and mm -hmm. then checking out uh some circular economies in peru that are that are kind of rising up and in both places as you talk to the uber drivers they all say the same thing when you tell them they're from el salvador they're like ah naive bukele we need a president <laughs> like that and yeah. it's um you know i'm not one a person that usually is positive about politicians, right. but I've got to say, I mean, in, in overall, just the, all the positive changes that you see happening, yeah. um, it's, it's really quite phenomenal. And so it's, it's kind of ironic that there's so many haters that are trying to criticize what's happening. But when you talk to people on the ground, you they're, they're ecstatic about what's happening. No doubt. So you guys moved here mm -hmm. to do what? Like, what was the plan? <laughs> what was the objective? <laughs> That's a that's a really great question. Um, all I knew is that I was excited and I wanted to help somehow. I had been retired for a couple of years, so I, I guess I had a little bit of restless uh, restlessness built up in me, and I wanted a new project that I could really sink my teeth into. I wasn't exactly sure what form it would take, but I knew that it was going to be something around. Uh, just helping make sure that the the Bitcoin experiment is no longer an experiment; it becomes a a, a reality, and so. <clears throat> My my first read on the situation was that uh, El Salvador has a lot of wonderful potential, but one of the pieces that's missing is just the human capital. Uh, and, and this is for a couple of different reasons. Obviously, there's been a brain drain here for you know 30 plus years, people leaving this country because opportunities were so much better elsewhere. And the situation here was completely unstable and, and not a fit place. If, if you were a young, bright individual and, and you maybe picked up some language skills or whatever, and you had the ability to leave, it made all the sense in the world to leave. And we're still feeling the effects of that uh, today. But what I like to, to say is that we've actually shifted that, you know, it's no longer a brain drain anymore. Now it's a brain game because some of the smartest people in the world, especially within the Bitcoin space, because uh, that's what got it on the radar screen yeah. first, they're deciding that we're going to come here to El Salvador. We're going to set up. And so the brain gain is absolutely underway. And uh, that's something that I think is really exciting. And, and I felt that that was a place where I could add value by helping those people who are experts in their field, uh, who have some kind of great skill that they can bring to the table. If I can help make their transition easier, then I'm like a force multiplier for all of the the, the folks that want to help build this country. And so that's uh, that's basically how the idea got started. And I love too. We've seen it's it's not just brains that are coming in. It's it's capital. It's that's people true. that are putting their money where their mouth is. 
where historically the, the families that control the wealth in El Salvador, they've been trying to get their money out of El Salvador. And so you've seen <laughs> right. in, a lot in, of them- In duffel bags on helicopters. In duffel bags, <laughs> selling their, their companies yeah. to, you know, to, to multinationals so that they can remove their funds to bank accounts in Miami. Yep. And so it's been historically the, the people who live here have been the, the least well. bullish mm -hmm. on the country. So to now see this kind of new wave of people coming in wanting to invest, putting their money where their mouth is, and a lot of Salvadorans returning mm -hmm. who have made you know, decent fortunes in the U.S. that are now returning and see yes. that there's better opportunities in El Salvador than there is in the U.S. That's the I ultimate mean, irony, and you love to see it. No, for me, that's, that's the thing that makes me the most excited. It's, yeah. you know, I get emotional about it. It's like, wow, this is so, who would have predicted this five years ago that you would see people actually returning to El Salvador right. because they think there's more opportunity here than there is in the U.S. And I feel that the, the people moving here from Europe, Australia, around the world feel that. And so that, that kind of feeling is contagious. Yeah. And that's why you just have a different sense in El Salvador. People are, are just bullish. They're, they're the, positive on the future where the rest of the world, people are negative on the future. You absolutely have the sense that uh, everyone here expects things are, are getting better and everybody expects things everywhere else are getting worse. Um, <clears throat> and so it comes down to, you know, where do you want to where do you want to place your bets? You know, uh, you, you have to you have to live somewhere. Yeah. You have to do something in life. Where are you going to do it? What are you going to do? And I can't think of a better place than El Salvador. And I can't think of a better project than Bitcoin than all, all the freedom it can uh, create. So you moved here, you saw that there was a need as all these people are trying to flow in. You yeah. thought you could kind of step in and be that kind of bridge that helps people through yeah. the process. So tell us, you know, how Escape to El Salvador came to be, um, what services you provide. Sure. So. In order to get my family set up here, uh, we had to network with a lot of different professionals. You know, residency attorneys, I consulted with a lot of business attorneys, uh, accountants, folks that could help me sort of like flesh out this idea and, and see what the future of the country really holds. So I had this sort of professional network and I realized right away that that, that network itself is, is very valuable because I had to do the, the, the hard work of actually finding these people, vetting them for professionalism and, and, and services and, and, and all of that. And so out of that network, what we did is we, we basically narrowed down two basic services. We wanted to offer residency services and, and that's going to take someone all the way from foreigner to, to citizen, if that's what they want. Uh, and then we have uh, a set of business services as well. So if you want to actually uh, incorporate and you want to raise money, you want to have a business in Bitcoin City, you know, we can do that as well. But from the residency side of things, it's basically that we work with a variety of different uh, attorneys. And I don't I specifically didn't go for like the absolute cheapest people that you can find. Right. For two reasons. Number one is you get what you pay for, you pay for what you get, right? And, and number two is I think that people should make a, a, a livable wage uh, and a respectable wage. So I found professionals that were really good at what they do, and we made arrangements where they get paid very well for their services. And that means an incredible value for the client because they're going to get it done right the first time and everything is going to go smooth. And when you're dealing with something as important as your family's residency and your legal status in a new country, um, you don't want to cut corners there. Uh, so that's one aspect of the residency package. On the business side of things, there's so many opportunities that uh, El Salvador presents, right? Uh, I say that setting up a business in Bitcoin City is like a zero tax life hack, and it can last as long as you want to. Uh, if you set up here, you're not going to have uh, taxes on income. Uh, you're not going to have taxes on capital gains. I'm not just talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about on everything. Uh, you can set up your, your business and when you're ready to, to pass it on, there's no estate taxes. Basically, the only tax that you're going to pay, which is going to directly support the operations of Bitcoin City, is value added tax, uh, right? So it's based on consumption. Um, people can take uh, you know different uh, approaches there, but I think that's a relatively fair way to, to do it. And uh, what that means for a lot of people that are interested in Bitcoin or interested in being a sort of global traveler or digital nomad type is that it makes a lot of sense for them to have their tax residency here 
as opposed to anywhere else, because it's really hard to beat zero percent, right? If you're living in a place like the United States, uh, if you're living in a place like Canada or, or, or Europe, uh, you're paying uh, incredibly high tax rates on, on the work that you do. And over the course of 20 years, 30 years of a career, it really adds up and it compounds. Why not make the change early on as you're starting your career and you're and you're doing that kind of work to go into a zero tax environment like El Salvador? And it's it's going to to exponentially increase what you can do with your wealth as you live here in, in El Salvador. Yeah. So let's let's first kind of run through the um, the people that want to get residency here yeah. and run through some of the details. And then we'll delve into the second part you're talking about with, sure. with the businesses. Um, I know Lou Kelly made an announcement early on that there was going to be this, you know, three if you invested three Bitcoin in mm -hmm. El Salvador, you would you would get uh, either residency or citizenship. That sure. has been something that is in a lot of people's minds, but it was not it was more of an idea of a concept of, hey, this is something that we're shooting for. Right. Um, but there are existing paths to residency, to citizenship right. that you don't have to wait for them to flush out that program or what it's going to involve. So can you kind of walk people through the different routes of what it takes to be uh, a resident? Do you need a sponsor? Do you need to set up a company? Right. What are the different things? And then just some of the costs involved. So sure. people have you know some estimates of what to look to spend. So uh, just to clear up some of the, uh, the misconception, um, because I, I get this question a lot, like, hey, where do I spend my three Bitcoin to, to get set up? Well, obviously that, that program was, was announced, but it has rolled into the Volcano Bond program, right? So there's no longer a three Bitcoin investment scenario. The new deal is that if you buy and hold $100,000 or more of the Volcano Bond token, then that will be a way to qualify you for residency. Now, we don't know any of the specifics. Ha, has that been announced? That. Because I, I've heard different rumors, and different things, but right. I've never heard that officially announced. So, so so we don't have the specific details of the program because that hasn't been announced yet, as you say. But that's the basic promise that was made by uh, President Bukele when he got up on the stage at the beach and said, hey, you know, here's here's what we're doing with the volcano bonds and, and raising money in this way. Um, that That's how it's envisioned to work. But that's only one method to, to obtaining residency and citizenship. There are and, 16 and it, others. And it excludes some big chunks of the population because so. yeah. Americans and Canadians they don't will the, not be able to participate in the bond issue as it's currently being devised. With, so. with one exception, if you are an accredited investor and you can get your accreditation through a service uh, called Bank to the Future, uh, you can participate in that way. But accreditation is uh, it's not the easiest thing to uh, to, to get certified for uh, in the United States. Uh, so effectively, it does uh, uh, keep a lot of people from, from participating. Uh, so for most people, there are other interesting options that are available to get residency right away. So you can get residency here in, in much the same way that you could in a lot of other countries. Like you've heard of getting a student visa to go to the, to the States or to some country in Europe to, to study. Well, you can get a student visa here as well. All you have to do is get uh, accepted by a, a, an education of higher learning in El Salvador, uh, make the application, and, and I'm, I would be surprised if you didn't get accepted. Uh, and you can use that as the basis of your, your residency application. You can come here as a worker. You can certainly set up a company, but you do not have to set up a company to get residency. You can work as an independent contractor or a sole trader. These are different terms that uh, you'll hear around the world that basically just mean that you are holding yourself out to the market and saying that I can work on a contract basis for a variety of different clients and earn my living as a software engineer or maybe even as a, you know, a salesperson or a property developer or there's a variety of different types of uh, job roles and descriptions that would qualify you under this program. And uh, this is where, by the way, the digital nomads uh, fall under. Uh, and so that's probably our most uh, popular program. But there are options for, for missionaries. There are options for folks that are coming here to work with uh, NGOs that are, that are you know, working with the, the government directly. Uh, like I said, there's 16 different pathways to residency. So there's something that's right for everyone. And, and uh, uh, pensioners as well. If you retire. There's a special program for retirees. Uh, you can qualify for our retiree um, visa with as little as $1,095 per month 
in income. So most of the folks, for example, from the United States or, or, or elsewhere, that maybe they have the Social Security payment. Uh, if you qualify, if you if you meet that bar, you can get residency here just based on that fact. And your dollars go a lot further here. Yeah. So what would be the the kind of steps and the timeline for people? Obviously, we can't go through all the different paths, but right. but choose one of them that you see most people taking. What what are the steps involved? What are the costs involved along the way? What are the services that you guys provide? Absolutely. So we've done everything that we can to keep the services below three thousand dollars, right? Um, but that gets you a variety of different things, and each residency program is functionally very similar. Uh, you're going to need your passport and your passport has to have a certain amount of validity remaining, right? At least six months when you make your application. So if you're getting low on your passport time, my recommendation is do that first. Renew your passport, get get as much time as possible uh, so that you don't have to deal with uh, your, your country of origin again if you don't want to. The second thing that's uh, absolutely necessary in every case is a criminal record check. So you, uh, in most places, you can go to your local police station and you can say, I want a criminal background check and they'll give you a little piece of paper and maybe the officer at the desk signs it. And that's great. You need that physical piece of paper because El Salvador does not recognize electronic background checks. It has to be a physical document. And then above and beyond that, anytime you have a document that's being produced in another country, it has to go through a process that we call legalization. And in some countries that might mean getting an apostille stamp. In some countries that might mean getting it uh, authenticated, the document. But typically there's um, an authority at the federal level that is responsible for verifying the um, the authenticity of documents and then they'll give a, a, a stamp. Uh, many countries are party to the Hague Treaty and it outlines what that stamp looks like and how it functions. So you're going to need to get that background check uh, apostilled or authenticated and then bring that physical document with the proper stamp with you to El Salvador uh, to start the process. Now, above and beyond that, the requirements for each program are going to, to differ slightly, but they're going to make sense with the program. So, for example, if you're applying as a student, then you're going to need school records, right? Yeah. You're going to need a diploma uh, issued from wherever you came from. You're going to need a letter of acceptance from the educational institution that you're going to attend in El Salvador. And if those documents are issued in other countries, they have to be legalized. Uh, here, it's not a problem. And then once you uh, bring all of those documents together, they have to be translated. Uh, and then our attorneys get involved to notarize everything a second or sometimes a third time uh, before it's all packaged together and submitted to immigration. That process, provided you land in El Salvador with the appropriate documents, we can have your application put together and submitted uh, within two weeks. And then immigration, by law, has 45 days to issue a decision on your application. And we see that typically happening between 30 and 45 days, although you have to give them a little bit of uh, wiggle room here. They're experiencing a tremendous increase in volume, yeah. <laughs> something that they haven't experienced in 30 years, right? So the long-term uh, employees of the immigration department are just, you know, they're, they're pulling their hair out a little bit right now, as you can imagine, because uh, they've just never had to deal with this uh, volume of individual applicants. So. But they're still doing a fantastic job and we're getting people that are getting approved and getting their cards, uh, you know, 30 days in. So and I think one one thing just to mention that for people to keep in mind there, uh, there is an, some expiration dates on those police records. And That's so right. you want to start the process right away because I've seen people who have waited a little while, then they submit everything and they expire before the immigration people That's actually correct. get to them. Yeah. Then they have to fly back and start the process over. So it's important to, for people to go into it realizing the time frames of, yes. of you know, make sure that they're falling within those. And just so everybody knows, that's so basically 90 days. There are a few minor exceptions to that, but it's basically 90 days. And <clears throat> The problem is on, on both sides of the border, right? So you want to get your process started here as quickly as you can. But at the same token, you want to make sure that you start the process appropriately where you're coming from. Let's take an example like the country of Canada, uh, who has experienced an enormous uh, exodus of people who uh, basically got fed up with the, the the policies of that government and said, we don't want to live in Canada anymore. They're selling their land. They're doing everything that they can to just get out. And they're fleeing, is the word that I would use. They're fleeing from a place like Canada. 
as a result. Their uh, background check and, and uh, authentication procedures, their legalization procedures are backed up in their uh, offices, right? So if you're a Canadian refugee, you want to make sure that you start that process to get your background check pretty early on. Uh, thankfully, it's, it's not too bad now, but it still can take a couple of months to like actually get your documents from Canada before you can even start the process down here. So it's not like we can solve all of those problems. We're, we're relying on you uh, to, to sort of manage your process as well. But if you have any questions about that, reach out to us specifically and, and, and ask and we'll, we'll guide you through the process. On a little bit of a side note, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but I, I have heard grumblings from Canadians <laughs> that they feel like the government of Canada is putting pressure on El Salvador to uh, scrutinize the Canadians that are coming in here more deeply. I don't know if you've seen that or... Well, I have to work very closely with the government of Canada in order to help these people, so I have no comment. <laughs> okay, we'll take that uh, for what it is. Um, so that is the, the process that people come in. They need to make sure they have those things ready. Right. You, you brought up that the you guys try to keep it under $3,000. Right. Is that for an individual? Is that for a family? So how, did, how would that differ? When you, when you add more people to the application, it gets easier. And we have discounts for spouses and for minor children. Uh, they each have their own requirements, but we can streamline the process because a lot of the work that our attorneys have to do is actual physical beat the street work, right? It's taking a package from one office to another to get a verification and, and, and running around. And so it's obviously easier and more time efficient to do that with multiple people uh, so so we can offer that that sort of thing as well so just just for uh, nothing that, that you'd be held to but just mm -hmm. an estimate for for a family of four what should they budget for a, fam for a family like of four should budget around four thousand dollars for all of the the legal fees uh, and and those are inclusive right so whenever you work with us uh, we're gonna pay the fee to immigration for you Right. We're going to pay for the origination and the uh, professional indications on all of the documents. Right. Uh, we're going to provide uh, logistic support. So transportation to and from wherever you are in El Salvador to the offices for the appointments that you need to, to do uh, all of those. It's, it's an inclusive service, basically. So if you're doing an apples to apples comparison, just make sure you ask what's uh, covered by the other uh, you know firms that you're looking at. And if, if somebody was doing this on their own, just paying the government fees and doing all that stuff on their own, you think that it'd be about half as much or would that be a fair estimate? I, I, that would probably be fair, maybe even a little bit less. But the, the real issue is that you have to get your document <coughs> handled by Salvadoran translators <coughs> excuse me, and uh, Salvadoran notaries. It works a little bit differently in El Salvador that it does in, in some places, like it was different for me in, in the US. A, an attorney can be a notary, uh, right? But it's an additional pro, uh, uh, procedure for the attorneys to do. So not every attorney in El Salvador is a notary that is able to notarize documents for this type of procedure. So you just have to make sure that you're, you're going with that. So you may have individuals just jump up and say, yes, I'm happy to uh, to help you, you know, apply and go to um, uh, to immigration. But it may turn out that they don't actually have the ability to to legally verify your documents. Right. So you have to make sure that uh, you have a notary. Uh, and, and that has to be done. Even if you do the process yourself, you're going to have to find someone that's going to stamp that before immigration will accept that. Yeah. I mean, as, as somebody who's gone through the immigration process here, I would say it's it's definitely better to uh, you know pay somebody to kind of hold your hand through sure. the process because other otherwise sometimes you get held up and you have to make additional flights back to the country that you're coming from to get documents and a lot of times it winds up being more expensive in in the long run. So well, that, that's, the that's thing, why right? I always tell people to eh. mistakes mistakes with immigration can be very expensive because you're absolutely right. They can involve you having to go to a different country to do a border run or to, to stay in a hotel for a couple of days or like those those expenses do add up. So you just want to make sure that you you properly plan, you do your research. If you have questions, by the way, like I don't charge for consultations or, or anything like that. Never have, never will. So if you have questions about what the procedure looks like, I'm happy to, to jump on a call with you at any point in time and explain the whole process, I've done it for several people. So at least you can educate yourself. And then from there, if you want us to help with the sort of the administrative stuff, I'm happy to do that as well. Awesome. So getting back to the second thing you brought up of, of you know, the advantages of setting up 
businesses here mm -hmm. with the, the tax implications of things. And, and um, I, I want to push back a little bit on, on some of the things that Please. you've said, just because I tend to be a skeptic uh, first and foremost about things. And we've heard a lot of these things promised, but I haven't seen the actual laws passed or sure. that actually set out. So I just want to be realistic with people on, hey, this is what they're saying is going to happen. But right. in my mind, I, I'm not 100% sure Bitcoin City is actually going to transpire. But sure. like I said, I'm a skeptic. I, I like to see things before I believe it. So are you talking about the existing tax structure that people can set up businesses on? And maybe there's things that I'm just not aware of. So, Well, so El Salvador has many different special economic zones already. Um, some of them done well, some of them not done well. Um, it has been a tool historically of um, uh, previous administrations to carve out uh, opportunities for friends. Um, and in this case, uh, the special economic zone for Bitcoin City is being uh, set up specifically around the, the concept of using uh, Bitcoin as, uh, as a currency and uh, uh, developing out the eastern part of the country for the entire uh, country's uh, benefit. So these, these special economic zones already exist in El Salvador. So you can go and you can find uh, different structures depending on what type of business you want to engage in. Maybe it's manufacturing and export. Uh, maybe it's just services related. Um, there are existing uh, tax benefits to coming to El Salvador already. Like, let's just go ahead and say that they're they're sort of in, in the Constitution, right? So one of the big benefits that people don't realize is there's just no property tax, right? So if yeah. you want to come and you want to purchase property here, even as a foreigner, which you're completely uh, able to do, uh, you have to pay a, a registration fee when you purchase land, but beyond that, there's no ongoing property tax. And so if your business is, um, you know, brick and mortar, if, if it's uh, something that's uh, involved with property development, uh, that's a huge benefit that, that only a handful of countries on the planet uh, actually allow for, right? So having no property tax is a big deal. And, and, and just to clarify that, because... Some people, you know, you, you say that and they're expected to pay nothing. There are mm -hmm. certain assessments that you still pay on the property, specifically in San right. Salvador. They can be a little bit higher at the beach. They're hardly anything. I mean, our, right. our house, it's probably a half million dollar, you know, house and we pay two hundred dollars a year and sure. and, you know, city fees. So sure. there are still some. But but compared to, you know, in the U.S., I'd be paying six thousand dollars a year. So <laughs> it's it's a different scenario. Yeah. Here. Yeah. And then you combine that with the fact that, uh, you know, we have a true territorial taxation system. So if your business involves, uh, you know, money that you generate from abroad, that doesn't uh, incur tax liability here. And that's on the personal and business uh, levels as well. So there's there's a lot of existing opportunity for businesses to get set up here uh, under our current sort of legacy laws. And then there's what's being proposed for Bitcoin City which takes it even further. And like I said, uh, uh, President Bukele was specific about um, taking that one uh, uh, nitpick that you had about the, the assessments. Like There'll be no municipal fees um, uh, according to the proposal for, for Bitcoin City. So whether you're uh, optimistic about that coming to uh, fruition or not, uh, that is at least the, the promise that's being held up to the world. And I honestly... Uh, am optimistic, but I also realize that it's going to be highly dependent on the success of the volcano bonds. Uh, because what people have to understand is that we are playing a new game by a new set of rules here, right? Big businesses, when we're talking about multinational businesses and, and countries, they have to finance their operations with debt. There's just no way for an organization as big as a country uh, to, to run <laughs> out of the till. Uh, you know what I mean? Like you're not going to be able to, to take your receipts and immediately put them to use. Uh, it just, there's just logistically it doesn't work. Yeah. So how these big uh, organizations uh, handle this process is on a regular basis, on a yearly basis, or maybe uh, less than that. They issue debt in, a, in large chunks. And that's what uh, these sovereign bonds are. And, um, you know, most of your uh, audience is probably are already going to know that the volcano bond offering is unique 
in, in history in the sense that we are breaking with uh, the traditional method of fundraising for, for countries. We're not asking permission from the International Monetary Fund. We're not running through a big bank like JP Morgan or you know those crony capitalists, right? We're not going to let them take 30% off the top and then dictate the terms of how we repay those loans. Like that's ridiculous. The, that's why developing countries stay developing and never get developed is because that sort of chokehold on their financial uh, sovereignty uh, prevents them from from developing. Uh, so we have to chart a different path. And the volcano bond token is an opportunity for us to raise the types of money, the, the, the amounts of money that are necessary to finance the operations of a country outside of the traditional legacy system, right? So the only way that Bitcoin City comes to fruition, the only way that it works is if the volcano bond issues and subscribes and we're able to do it over and over and over again and completely break the choke hold that the IMF has had on El Salvador. But you, you might say, okay, well, that's a big if. But look at the facts. Look at what has happened over the last year. You know, we've paid off debt. We paid it off early. We've shocked everyone in the bond market. We took the, the, the floating rate of our bonds from what, the 60s, uh, the mid 60s uh, to the high 90s just by President Bukele standing up in front of the world and saying, you know what, we're going to go ahead and pay off this debt early. It's shocking. Now, who else is doing that? Who else is paying off their debt early and at the same time domestically raising the amounts of, uh, that, that pensioners in El Salvador receive, right? Uh, so, so that the average person can have uh, a better standard of living in their retirement. To, to, to manage both of those things is just mind boggling. But uh, to get back on, to, on, on track, the success of Bitcoin City is dependent on the, su the success of the volcano bonds. So we have to remember that and uh, do everything we can to support it. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, the critics would question, OK, what, what is this, you know, alchemy that they're able to raise the, the spending and, you know, do all these things at the same time? Where are they getting the money from? It's, you know, Bukele always says, like, well, if you're not stealing the money that, that you know, there's that more it's than enough su sufficient. Yep. Um, which I buy to, to some degree. Like I said, I'm always a, I'm always a skeptic. What, sure. what I have been very impressed with is I think it was Bank of America came in and did an analysis and I think I remember that. They actually. said that the the percentage of GDP collected in taxes went up 2%, which mm. is huge. It went from like 17% to almost 20%. Mm. And that was without any tax increases. That right. was just from enforcement and in, <laughs> yeah, for more compliance right. within the system, but also from the economy expanding. So yes. there was more revenue to collect because sure. of that. So the, I think they said something like they've never seen that type of increase in tax revenue without a major tax overhaul. So right. the fact that they raised all this additional tax money without raising taxes. It shows you how much huge. money was being pulled yeah. out. You know, uh, when, when I talked earlier about, you know, duffel bags of cash and helicopters, I mean, I was making a veiled reference to previous administrations that were just taking millions upon millions of dollars it, just in, in cash out of yeah. the country and, and setting it up elsewhere. Uh, that has come to a grinding halt. And, and wouldn't you know it, but now all of a sudden we have money to do the things that governments typically do. Well, and I think it just wasn't it wasn't just the, the government graft. It was also most businesses had all these loopholes and ways That's to skirt time. around paying legitimate taxes. And sure. I mean, I'm as anti-tax as they come, but I think in order for a system to work, you have to have taxes as low as possible, but mm -hmm. equal enforcement so that everybody's paying them. And so well, and, and I think that's, that's what El Salvador is doing. You're, you're absolutely right. And that's why some of those families were able to, to get ahead and stay ahead for so long as they use those rules to their advantage and, and, and those loopholes. And if they didn't like what it, what was happening, they would, you know, buy another politician and get another rule passed. Right. Well, those days are over. Right. And so what we're going to do moving forward is uh, uh, collect the right amount which is uh, fairly applied across uh, society and, uh, you know, spend it wisely and, and, and spend it on things that we truly need uh, yeah. to, to bring the country up. No, I think then that's, that's the only fair way to do it. I Absolutely. mean, that, that is how development has to happen. There has to be some level of, of taxation in order right. for things to be able to function. And everybody wants roads. They want basic things. Sure. And so we need to make sure that's enforced fairly, but historically it's been the wealthy who have been able to avoid all of that. I think Bukele was giving one speech somewhere and he said like, hey, 
the cell phone companies say they don't have any cell phone towers in this area, but I have five bars on on my phone. Like that's the type of thing they. Right. No, we don't have any operations there. You're like, yeah, <laughs> obviously. <you do." laughs> so, I yeah. think we've seen um, a lot of. I think the tax compliance has come way up. I think mm -hmm. for two reasons. One, the people who were politically protected before realize they no longer have that protection. Right. But I also think just people, when they see the government spending on things that benefit the people, they are more likely to voluntarily comply with taxes. I, th I think and that's so, true too. There's, so there's I think a, that's a positive sign yeah. that that's what we're seeing here. No. So I'm very encouraged. So I don't know if we have uh, the the meme that you posted on Twitter the other day, which is one of my <laughs> one of my favorites. Um, so. <laughs> I think you said uh, Bukele retweeted this one. Yeah, it, it, I think that it just like really shocks people when they see it because uh, who 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 would have thought uh, just a couple of years ago that so many people would be seeing El Salvador as an opportunity for them for themselves and their families? It, it, it really is uh, truly the case. It's shocking. I thought that it was uh, appropriate to to make a meme out of it, but uh, uh, yeah, no, it, it just shows you uh, how popular it's getting. And it's been, the thing that's been surprising to me has been across the board. I mean, mm. being an American, we tend to be American centric. So I thought, oh, it's going to be mostly people from the U.S. that are going to want to come here. But I it's, thought so it's too. really people from around the world. Yes. I mean, tons of Europeans, Australians, New Zealand, I mean, Indians. I mean, it's really been like from around the world that people are, yes. are flooding into here. So. I don't know. I think we have uh, a couple pictures of some people with their yeah. That's <laughs> that's a proud uh, residency Shout card out to uh, owner there. Yeah. Um, wh where I don't know if you can publicly divulge, but where he's from or so what? So uh, I, I won't talk about his particular circumstance, but I will talk about the circumstance of the the gentleman in our next uh, photo. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a few weeks ago, we had. Uh, uh, a really great success. And I want to talk about this. So here we're looking at uh, Victor and Saul. When I first came to El Salvador, I was doing a lot of interviews. I was looking to hire some uh, kitchen staff to start working with. I think I might have told you when you came up to, um, uh, to, to see me in San Salvador that I was thinking about opening a, a restaurant and I'm trying to do some menu development. Anyhow, long story short, both of these guys applied. And they, they came in and, and we started talking about their backgrounds and uh, they were uh, thrilled to have the opportunity. And they had some really strong culinary background as well. Like some, I was really impressed. Um, and then I, I went to ask them and say, okay, well, listen, I need to, to get your identification because we have to register you with, uh, you know, our, our social security here, the AFP, like all of the things that you have to do with a normal uh, employment relationship. And, you know, they, they had an expired Venezuelan passport. And I look at it and I'm like, what's going on here? You know, and, and so we, we ask uh, some, some probing questions and we get into it. And it turns out uh, that they approached some people at the, or I'm, I'm going to try to be careful here. I'm not going to give any specific names because someone smart enough might be able to figure this out. But let's just say uh, diplomatic staff uh, from El Salvador in Venezuela. Um, actually convinced these guys to 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 leave Venezuela for a better opportunity in El Salvador and they were uh, happy to do it so they, they they came to the to the to the country but the person uh, had tricked them basically and uh, were paying them uh, much lower wages than they should have been uh, paid charging them for, uh, you know, rent and food and things of that nature uh, and basically keeping them in a, in a slave relationship. It's, it's what it was. Let's be realistic. Right. Uh, it was a, a terrible situation for them. They didn't get the, the legal help that they needed to get set up here uh, officially in, in El Salvador. And eventually they were able to escape from that situation. Uh, but now they were illegal in El Salvador. Uh, and so when I found this out, I started doing some research and uh, we brought in a specific attorney just to handle their case. And I created the uh, about a month later, uh, something on Geyser Fund, uh, which is a, a, a crowd raising crowdfunding uh, thing for the Bitcoin community. Uh, you should definitely check it out, geyser.fund. Um, I created something called the Refugee Assistance Fund. And it's uh, basically a way for folks to contribute so that uh, we can take cases like Victor and Saul and uh, get them established with uh, with legal residency. And that's what we've been able to do. We were able to do it where they they paid their fines because technically they, they broke the law, right? So they had fines to pay, but we covered that. They were able to apply for residency and we covered those applications 
application fees as well. And now they are on their path to legal residency and ultimately citizenship because they want to live in El Salvador. They love El Salvador for the opportunity that it has. But without official uh, papers, like your life is uh, is is a challenge. So um, I, I like to to explain their situation and say that they're not alone. They're not alone. There are many people that are like that. Not only in El Salvador, obviously around the world. And you know, we get questions from people, you know, reaching out to us from uh, a lot from like places like Nigeria, Lebanon, uh, saying, you know, it is absolutely terrible where we are because of you know hyperinflation yeah. or like uh, the the central bank digital currencies, and they don't want to get involved with that. Uh, so they're reaching out, but they don't have uh, the resources to do it. And I'd like to be able to help more of them. So if you feel the same way, you can go check out our uh, our page on geyser.fund. And how would they find that? I'm not real familiar with how that works. Can they just search for yeah, the project? I, actually, or? I, I think that they um, that the geyser folks who are adding the, the, the search functionality um, uh, Actually, no, uh, as we speak to that. But uh, there are several different uh, deserving projects on Geyser Fund, so definitely uh, explore it and, and see what else catches your eye. And, and uh, But what's the title of yours, just so the uh, people The that... Refugee Assistance Fund. Okay, perfect. So definitely encourage yeah. people to, to donate to that. Check it out. Um, yeah, you, can help, you can help make a, a real solid difference in people's lives. It is, it is amazing just how... Uh, El Salvador really has become uh, a beacon of hope for refugees from around the world. So we've seen a ton of Canadians that are coming in here who lost their jobs because they didn't want to get vaccinated. Yep. Um, people from Europe, people from around the world that now see El Salvador as a place of hope. And, and, so, and sadly, that trend is going to continue. Yeah. I mean, are, are there any of us truly that are going to look at the world and say, uh, you know, things are getting better in some of these countries? No, we know that they're getting worse. And th there's going to be more and more violence inflicted on individuals in those countries. And more and more, they're going to stand up and they're going to look around and say, where are we going to go? And I would love to help make El Salvador that choice destination. Yeah. Yeah, people always push back. Oh, they're not refugees. They have finances. And like, well, some of them do, but right. they've lost their job. Their their freedom is being threatened, and they see El Salvador as as a beacon of hope, as a yes. place where they want to put down roots and become Salvadoran and this to be home because they feel like there'll be more freedom here. Yep. You also have you know people like the the Venezuelans that there's millions you know floating throughout Latin America and right everywhere. now because of what has happened in Venezuela. I mean, yep. it's just been a tragedy. I think. Everywhere I travel, whether it's Miami or, or Lima or in Brazil or Argentina, the, the Uber drivers are all Venezuelan because for a lot of them, that's the only work that they can find. Yeah. A lot of them are, you know, on questionable legal status in the countries where they're at. And yep. so um, we definitely need places like El Salvador that will be a beacon of hope for people where they can, you know, come bring the talents they have and, and start a new future here. So. So that's super exciting for me to see, um, yeah, the, this type of story of people that are that are making El Salvador home. Um, just curious, what business opportunities you see in, in El Salvador in general, like just from from your experience. So, it's it's challenging, okay, because I want to be realistic and I want to tell people that we're in a transition, right? So I get a lot of requests from you know young people around the world saying like, I need to, to move to El Salvador, but I, I need to be able to support myself, you know? Um, and I'm going to just be frank with you, like you don't want to come to El Salvador and then start looking for a job. Uh, because if you find it, it's just not going to cut it for yeah. you. Uh, let's just be realistic. The minimum wage here is only $365 per month for most service sector jobs. And if you were lucky enough to get that job because you had impeccable local Spanish and uh, an incredible work ethic, because let's face it, Salvadorans are hardworking people. Definitely. And if you're competing in a labor market with hardworking people, you're going to have to bring your game to the next level. But even if you are lucky enough to get that job, it's probably not going to be enough to support you as an individual like living alone in an apartment. That's not going to happen. Uh, so if you are considering the move, then you need to do everything that you can to find remote work and, and do that first and foremost. Even if the remote work wouldn't be sufficient to support you in a place like the United States or Germany or the UK or wherever, like if it's less money than you would be able to live on there, that's probably still fine because it's going to go a lot further here. Uh, and like I said, you know, the retiree minimum is only $1,095 per month. That's because the government 
did a, an analysis and said, okay, what amount of money should we require uh, pensioners to have in order to know that they can live comfortably uh, on, on, on their own without having to worry about, you know, government services and all these other things. So you can live very affordably here, but it's like everywhere else too. Like you can get, you know, a $3,000 apartment if you want. Uh, so there are the high end, uh, there's the high end as well, uh, but you can live very affordably. So if you get that remote work, even if it's not sufficient for where you are, go ahead and do it, get it under your belt, uh, get, get used to the procedures of being a remote worker and then come here with that income and you're going to be fine. Yeah, I always like to tell people to be realistic about what the cost is going to be because th people, oh, well, if the minimum wage is $365 a month, then <laughs> I should be able to live fine on $500 a month. Yeah, no. it, I mean, it's it's all relative. Most people that are making that, they have multiple family members yes. that are coming together or yes. they're not paying for the place that they're, they're living in because it's been in the family forever. Yeah. People come to El Zante and they really are shocked that it's, you know, a lot of them will say, well, it's more expensive to rent a place here than it was in, you know, Kansas City yep. or Miami, uh, maybe not Miami, but but compared to a lot of the more low cost places in the U.S. Yep. And There's specifically context. El Zante. I mean, yep. El Zante is probably now the most expensive place in yep. El Salvador. Yeah, it's definitely and so if you come here and you want a house on the beach, you're mm -hmm. going to need to spend a million dollars. But you can go to a small town, you know, in, in the mountains and, get, and get a house for yeah fifty thousand dollars. So. Um, or pay rent that's $300 a month. So yeah. it really is all over the board. People just need to be realistic. If, yeah. if you want to be on a high rise in San Salvador, you're probably going to pay $1,500 to $3,000 a month yeah. for, you know, for that. But, you, but know, you don't have to have that. You don't lifestyle. have to have that. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I just tell people. It's you can live here very cheaply, mm -hmm. but don't expect to live a life of luxury very cheaply. Sure. I mean, it's like anything. You get what you pay for. And, and to go a little bit further into your question, like what are the opportunities? I definitely recommend people check out the, um, uh, the architect that's uh, responsible for the plans for Bitcoin City. Um, uh, Fernando Romero, uh, I believe, is the, the name. I may be... Uh, chopping that up a little bit. Uh, but, you know, that firm and uh, the government itself is hiring architects, engineers, civil engineers, people with like big construction experience right now. Uh, in fact, uh, Mario and I are going to uh, a job fair on Friday just to kind of network with all the different people that are hiring. So I should have more information to better answer your question then. And uh, if you're curious about that, if you're watching the video and, and you want to know more about it, just, you know, ping me on Twitter and uh, I'll, I'll answer your questions about that. But to, to make the, uh, the small point is that if we're going to build an entire city, we're going to need everything. There's not going to be a job role that isn't, you know, imagined uh, that could be helpful there. So it really doesn't matter what you do or what kind of skills you have. You can play some kind of a role. Be realistic about it uh, and have, you know, other income if you can possibly uh, do that. But we're going to need all we're going to need it all to make a whole city. Yeah. And I think even outside of Bitcoin City, I see tons of opportunities, restaurants, hotels, yep. all that stuff of tourism especially related. people that have tourism history that yep. understand what um, clients coming from around the world are, mm -hmm. are looking for. You know, a lot of times you, you have some things that are harder as a foreigner yep. because you're, you're operating in an unfamiliar environment, but you have some advantages because you understand what certain clients want, what certain needs are, and you can sure. see the holes in the market of, hey, nobody's serving this point right here. And so all those things come together and build a stronger economy for everybody. Yep. Um, and so Just, that's what I encourage people to come and don't expect to come here and run a hotel or restaurant if you have no background in right, that. But right. if you have a background in that- And, and your Spanish you have, is great. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a business in the US, but I also feel like I see way more opportunity in El Salvador yeah than I do in the US at this point. You could throw a rock and hit a business idea yeah. that it's gonna work, you know, you just gotta put the effort in. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So where can people find out more about the services that, that you guys sure. offer? I wanna make sure people have an easy handoff to, to be able to find. Uh, yeah, so I mean, to, to plug it, it's escape to El Salvador dot org is the website uh you can jump on twitter and search for escape to el salvador the actual handle is el salvador visas um yeah and uh, i'm a pretty responsive guy so if you reach out i'm also extremely online so it doesn't really matter just send me a little message i'll i'll get back to you and answer whatever questions you have is there any other projects or anything you've seen here that 
Do you want to promote that you see? Oh that my goodness, are... I, I I feel terrible because I could list five of them and I'd forget twenty, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. the the guy would reach out and say, "Why didn't you talk about my project?" But there are so many really cool. Uh, th so many people have come here, just like what you said, identified a space where they can improve, and. Um, and, and just started doing it, you know, and, and, and these are great folks with, uh, you know, we're all like minded individuals here. We want to see this thing succeed and uh, we're doing it for the most part the right way. There were a few people at the very beginning that uh, were relatively scammy, but I think uh, you would agree that we've pretty much run them out of town at this yeah. point. Well, so. Stacy's done a good job. There you at, go. She's uh, cracked the whip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's a, a great gatekeeper. Mm. Uh, one, one more thing before we leave, because I know it's something that that is a hangover from the past that people are kind of concerned about, and it's recently resurfaced as the the U.S. government reissued a travel advisory mm -hmm. level three for El Salvador, which I can't remember the exact language, but it basically sounds like you're going to die if you come here to mm -hmm. to avoid it, unless you know it's you know unless it's an emergency that you have to be here, you shouldn't be traveling, which is is just hilarious as right. far as I'm concerned, but. What would you say to people about security and concerns about uh, those sorts of things? People who haven't visited here before, but are just taking everything they see from the media. Sure. I, I think that if you have concerns about security, I think the last person or, or group or entity that you should be listening to is the United States government. I don't trust anything that they say about pretty much anything. So I would, I would take it with a grain of salt. And in general, you that you felt safe. I felt, you felt safe yeah. completely. Yeah. yeah, there's there's there has not been a single moment in my entire experience in El Salvador where I have felt unsafe ever. Yeah. So just for people to get hung up on things like that, just yeah. you know, take it with a grain of salt. Look at the bigger picture. A lot of times, there's things behind the scenes that are influencing yeah. those political. decisions and sure. and why those things come out. And uh, yeah, come to El Salvador and and See make for yourself. make your own decision on how safe you feel there. So, uh, Jeremy, it's been Thank amazing so much, to, to really have you here. It. I'm excited to, uh, even, even during this discussion, it's made my wheels turning on a bunch of different things. So Great. looking forward to maybe we can follow up, uh, you know, in a few months and, uh, hit on some different subjects here. That sounds great. I look forward to it. All right. Thanks. Thanks.